Hello, everyone, and welcome to It's Alive, Reviving OER with Interactive Content to Create a Living Online Course at the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries. My name is Gabby Hernandez, and I am the Open Education Librarian at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. As a member of the TCDL Planning Committee, I am so pleased to be um, your session moderator today. Before we begin, I'd like to first do a little bit of housekeeping. Texas Digital Library and the TCDL Planning Committee are dedicated to providing an experience for everyone that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive of all the people. We ask that everyone here today be considerate and respectful in speech and action, attempt collaboration before conflict, refrain, refrain from demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior in speech, and be mindful of your environment and of your fellow participants. This session will run um, until approximately 1050, so please feel free to take breaks as you need. I invite you to say hello in chat and let us know where you're joining from, share resources, and make comments throughout today's session. You are also encouraged to post your questions in the chat. I will be watching for your questions and will share them with our speakers during our Q&A session at the end. Now I am pleased to present our speaker, John McLeod, and I will hand things over to you now to get started. Thank you very much, Gabby. Um, it's uh, a real treat to, to join you for uh, the Texas Digital Libraries Conference. And uh, uh, I really, uh, I'm just gonna start sharing my screen so that I can welcome the guests that I've uh, included today as well. Um, so I, I've asked a few panelists um, to join us. Um, and these were all users of Pressbooks results uh, at their institutions um, over the last year. Um, and um, they're going to speak to some of their experience. Um, so I have uh, Lara Tompkins from the College of DuPage. Uh, Lara's an instructional designer at uh, DuPage. Uh, Julie Mazura from the University of Washington. Christine Jones from Glendale Community College and Mick Davis from Umpqua Community College. I hope I get that community college name right. <laughs> that one stumps me almost every time. Um, what I thought I'd do uh, for the group is uh, just start to talk about um, the product that they were using uh, over the past year uh, with their OER textbooks published through Pressbooks. So uh, H5P is a HTML product uh, HTML5 product that enables uh, instructors and authors to create interactive uh, elements to assess learning. They can embed these uh, uh, H5P activities within uh, their Pressbooks uh, books themselves. And there's a number of different H5P interactive activities. There's branching scenarios, drag and drop, multiple choice and quiz sets. There's over 48 different um, H5P uh, interactive activities that you can select from. Not all of them will produce a grade uh, within a grade book, but using Pressbooks results, you can uh, integrate your product uh, and your course material, material can be integrated into an LTM, uh, LMS using LTI 1.3 integration. So that securely connects the content uh, published in Pressbooks to your LMS. So um, what I thought I'd do next, and, and I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen right now so that uh, we can um, use the spotlight feature on whoever's talking. Um, but I've got some questions uh, to, to get the uh, discussion going with our group. And uh, I guess first off, uh, maybe I'll put this to Christine or to anyone on the group who wants to answer, but uh, Christine, what was your motivation to use OER material? So I actually had a student come to me at the beginning of a semester prior to using OER material who told me that they couldn't afford to buy the textbook. And we did our best to work together, but the textbook that we were using at the time required interactive activities to be done online. And so not being able to afford the textbook meant not passing the class. It didn't matter how well they did and everything else, not using the textbook meant they couldn't pass the class. 
And I never wanted to be in that space again. So after that semester, I said I would never use a textbook like that again. And immediately started working towards OER. That's that's probably a common story. Uh, Julie, is that similar to your experience? I think that um, I started um, working with OER probably about four years ago and trying to find a really good um, textbook um, to help offset the cost. But really, it was, um, yeah, just getting more access to more students. Um, but I wanted to, to kind of expand a little bit more about the experience that I had in, in, in actually implementing the um, the technology or the HP five, if that's okay, um, I yeah. So that one of the things that um, you know, trying to find an open source textbook, um, I didn't have the opportunity to create my own, and so I was able to find one that was good and valid. And so I I gave this opportunity to my students, like here's a great textbook, you know, and I'm saving you guys tons of money and time and and gaining access, and I. Um, was speaking to a student after the quarter was over and she mentioned she never read the textbook because you know I had created all this content and I had you know they followed along with the lecture and so I was like huh what is a way that I can actually assure that these students with are actually reading the material and that's where this HP5 this interactive content um, was quite intriguing for me um, and I you know this I'm very new to this um, and so I, I joined this group, this actual working group, um, to develop these activities to, to actually ensure that the students were not only reading the textbook, but um, were able to comprehend and understand the material. And so that was really uh, my um, greatest interest in, in joining this work group um, and developing not only the OER uh, uh, material, but having more students be accountable for really actually reading the material. So, uh, yeah. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, that's a great point because so you've started using OER because uh, maybe students weren't uh, buying a textbook that you had previously used, uh, similar to Christine. But even though you supplied the text and no charge, they still weren't reading the material. Mick, is that different than your experience in Oregon? Uh, I mean, it was it's pretty similar to the same kind of issues. We were using a textbook. Um, I have sequence classes, and in those classes, it was fine. They bought a book, and they used it for three terms, and they kind of got more of their money's worth. But I had one, one course, and it was um, for students who weren't majoring in science, and so they just needed that one term. But the book that they had to buy had three terms worth of content in it, and it was just such a waste um, of paper and money. Uh, so that's when I started looking at OER and um, created a, a book for that course. And then later on, when H5P became a thing, that I added those um, later on for exactly the reasons that uh, Julie was just saying. Great, thank you. Now, Laura. Uh, in your role as an instructional designer, what is your motivation to help faculty um, use technology in this way? Uh, it's it's a bit selfish, if I'm being honest. I happen to be low vision or visually impaired, so I approach a lot of my work through a disability lens. And I also know firsthand what it's like to be a student having to use an inaccessible big publisher homework system and how difficult it can be to persist, particularly in STEM fields. Um, so that's kind of what lit my fire <laughs> for sure in terms of getting faculty on board. Okay, great. So I don't think that it's necessarily selfish, but I uh, <laughs> appreciate how you coached it like that. Um, so uh, Christine or, or Julie, uh, what did you want to accomplish uh, when you uh, started using this product with the reporting of grades? Well, I wanted to monitor how well the students were doing with the materials that I had provided them. So um, I approached it a little less as in the students not reading the textbook. 
um, I knew they were reading the textbook because I also require Cornell notes from my textbook chapters. So that wasn't as much of an issue for me, but I wanted to make sure they understood the materials that they were accessing. So um, having those grades recorded for me was monitoring their understanding of the different parts of the book as I actually was going to be using them in the class. So that was my primary um, motivation for making sure that they were accessing those activities and seeing those results. And I did see uh, a difference between some of the grades for certain chapters so I could go over those materials that I knew that they weren't understanding or necessarily able to apply. And then would you spend more time on, on those topics in class based on those results? Oh, yeah. If there was something that they weren't understanding, if they have, say, for example, the rhetorical appeals were not as understandable for them and knowing exactly what it was that they needed to do with them, I could actually spend an entire day focused on here's how we do these things. Let's do these activities in class to make sure you understand them. So it was a simple um, application process. These are the things they're not understanding. These are the things I need to focus on. If they understood something, there's no reason for me to go back over it. That's great. Julie, is that similar to your experience? Well, I actually, um, this was the first, um, this year was the very first year that I, I did adopt um, the H5P technology. Um, and so I kept it really low, um, very low. So I was just mostly again, tracking to ensure that the students were reading the material, um, the, the questions were really low um, questions, um, just to, to ensure that they understood concepts, it was very low. Um, but then I started kind of playing around a little bit. So although I was new to um, implementing this new technology, uh, in my case, um, I actually started experimenting with other things besides just a multiple choice question and really getting into more higher cognitive um, understanding, which is really kind of fun. And I also approached it a little bit differently. And I was very honest with my student, not being the expert that they needed to communicate with me. Again, this is my very first year. And, and when I joined this work group, um, the very first quarter that I had ever played with this, um, uh, with this technology, um, and so the students were actually like, oh yeah, that worked or that didn't work. Um, and so I'm looking forward to, because of the feedback um, and the experience that the students had to use this material or this, um, my textbook now with hopefully, as I'm sure it's never flawless as Mick can attest to, it seems like we're always updating our material. Um, but for this next uh, fall, I'll be um, using the, the the um, textbook plus the H5P content and the students hopefully will have a better experience or more a better learning experience where I can go back and do some more assessment like Christine had um, pointed out um, just just now. Yeah. That's great. Mick, um, maybe you can talk about what types of H5P activities you were using with your students. Okay, yeah, I um... I created the, the, the book and then added the H5P activities. Um, and it, I normally was using them just as sort of um, comprehension checks. So I had many of them embedded into the text, sort of like each page had one or two. So they would read some content and then immediately, the, the question was embedded immediately after. Um, and just to sort of like, Get that early and often feedback because um, the students who are not majoring in science but are taking their first college science class often really do not want to um, come and get help and so that early and often feedback is super important um, i was doing i also do that with quicker questions in class and i had sort of added this h5p to help supplement and then COVID hit and so it absolutely saved my bacon um, because i didn't have the peer response systems going in class anymore and so I was it was really uh, good timing and uh, it was very helpful to have be able to look every day and see um, who had answered what question and how and then also it just kind of motivated them to maybe actually ask a question in the zoom because they had worked on a homework uh, and couldn't finish it so uh, yeah it, it worked out really well that way for me 
Uh, sorry, you asked about what types of questions. <laughs> I apologize. I got sidetracked. Um, That's I mostly right. use, uh, multiple choice and uh, numeric answer. And there's so many features that um, I ended up using um, the uh, text entry for almost everything, even for numeric answer questions, because they could still just put in the correct number with correct units and everything. And, and so I was able to change the features and the feedback so that I could use that one question type for almost everything, actually. Great. You, you mentioned feedback. What kind of feedback could you provide? Uh, well, so <clears throat> depending on, you know, um, what percentage of the question they get right, you can ask, you can say, oh, great, you're almost there or things like that. But also um, there's options to put hints into each uh, entry field um, that they can look at the hints. And um, also you can put multiple correct answers so that if they write their answer in a little bit different way than someone else, if you've thought ahead about that a little bit, it'll still count it correct. Um, so those things were, were very helpful to be able to use just like basically one question type to do everything. Well, that's great. So, um, Christine, what were you, uh, did you use certain activities for your use case with your students? So I have something close to 86 different um, H5P activities in my textbooks. Um, more in the new variation that I'm doing now. Um, and I use an absolute mix and variety. Some of them are the ones that can actually import with the grades and other ones are just informational. So I have image hotspots and accordions that are just informational and the students know that those are informational. Um, whereas I have the question sets, multiple choice, um, drag and drop and interactive videos with embedded question sets in them um, throughout the textbook. Every chapter has at least two to three activities in it. Uh, some chapters are quite activity heavy because I want to make sure that the students fully understand. So it'll have a little video with a couple of interactive questions, then a piece of text followed by a question set that the students do. And that question set is the primary, this is what I'm checking on, whereas some of the other questions might not be. So, and I have them identified as assignments. So they have a title on them. So the students know that this question set is actually the one that they're going to get graded on, whereas other ones might just be practice. Okay. So the students know what's counting and, and what's there for, for the learning purposes. Laura, uh, that brings up a, a question I want to ask you. Just uh, was it, what is important for an instructor to remember when they're setting up these types of activities and questions with their students? Question, uh, first, firstly, just keep it simple. Um, I use a lot of graphic organizers with my faculty as we start building these activities up which has a few cool benefits. One, we're kind of opening up the instructional design aspect of the activity in a really simple, confined way. Um, whether it's the ADDI model or backwards design, that definitely helps with just building. Um, another thing that's great, having things in a really simple text-based format is that your content is then future-proof. Um, not saying that like what happened to uh, Flash will happen to H5P, but whether it's you know, variations of tech being no longer supported or changes on users devices that make, you know, cross device scripting and things like that, that can make um, interactive activities challenging for students to do sometimes. Or if someone identifies an accessibility barrier with an activity, you have a no frills fallback that you can pretty easily give to them. So that's my main one. And then second thing is, always copy and edit than rebuilding from scratch. Um, it's so much faster. And once you get into that workflow, I think HYP just works like butter. That's a that's a good tip, uh, especially since there's now so many repositories of H5P activities that are available. Um, I, I provided a link in, in my uh, PowerPoint to the eCampus Ontario uh, H5P repository, but there's a number of them. And, and for most of the activities that are in those repositories, they're openly licensed. 
um, and you can download, adapt them on your own. So um, again, many hands makes for light work. So um, when using H5P or other interactives with students, are there any other things to consider? Um, uh, you mentioned uh, um, to not just rely on that technology, but are there any other considerations that you'd uh, suggest for instructors? I think just asking yourself, does it, does it need to be an activity? <laughs> um, I think it's really easy, and especially with H5P, because we all want to click it, we all want to play with it. And it's such a great tool to get faculty in the door um, and wanting to develop what we are just because they're like, they've seen H5P and that got them excited. Um, so I just caution people from having a solution in search of a problem, which is just really easy to do when you are taken by the technology. Um, and H5P is certainly impressive enough to, <laughs> to do that for most. That's great. Julie, I saw you nodding your head there. Is that something that you experienced? Yeah, I think that, you know, you get into this puzzle pattern, you know, da, 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 da. it was good. It was refreshing to hear Christine mention like, some of the stuff she's got heavy um, content and some isn't, you know, so uh, that that's super important. One of the things as I was listening to uh, this panel share is that it sounds like, you know, the drop and drag and then there's the, the multiple choice and the, you know, there's so many different things, the, the text entry, it sounds quite complex and complicated, but it actually is for, it's pretty, it's so user-friendly. Like it's just reading one, um, the, the learning curve isn't as steep as what one would think from just listening to us speak. Um, I figured it out, you know, uh, right away. And, and um, I'm, I'm tech, I'm tech uh, comfortable. <laughs> I'm not tech savvy. I'll say that. Um, and, and there was, uh, it was just really easy to do. So yeah, you can fall into this trap of, of following the puzzle. I have to have five questions in here and this is, you know, in the next chapter, um, but really making sure that you're being very efficient and not just, you know, tinkering uh, with the material. I think that's super important. So yeah, great advice, Laura. <laughs> So um, what you, you brought it up earlier that uh, your students um, uh, gave a lot of feedback and that you've developed more. What kind of feedback did you hear from your students? Um, it was more, um, I think, and, and as probably as instructors and everyone here, it's, it's, it's easy to teach. Um, it's, it's, um, having the experience of being a learner is way more important than being able to teach. So, so the students actually were giving me feedback, like that didn't work or, um, you know, this was super confusing. Can you clarify this? And I think that was, that was a uh, great feedback. And if I had it to do it all over again, I probably would have maybe tried to find a course that I could take, or maybe a workshop that I could have been the, on the learner side to see what the students were actually seeing. So Although we do have um, the ability to see what the students um, uh, see, uh, getting their feedback and, and their experience was, was just so helpful for me. Um, and so I did have a series of surveys um, that um, followed each of the chapters just to say, hey, what worked, what didn't work? And, and that was helpful for me. And, and I honestly can say it wasn't about the learning the material as much as their experience of, of utilizing the technology is, is really the kind of feedback that I was getting from students. So again, I'm looking forward to looking at the learning aspect um, as I continue to use this technology. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Mick, was that similar to your uh, student feedback? Yeah, I, I think generally my students were, um, they found it easy to use and uh, they did appreciate that they had an online homework system effectively, but it was like inside the book because usually those are two separate things. You have a book and then you log into a separate online homework system. So being able to just go to our LMS and have everything there, including the book and the online homework is all through like a single sign-on was, uh, I think they really appreciated that. Uh, the other thing I learned was that it did really help them um, be comfortable with coming to ask a question of me, which is something that I really struggle with. Hold on, Greg. I really have a, um, like a sometimes a not nice looking face if I'm thinking hard. 
I, I look intimidating and I know it. So my wife tells me all the time. Uh, so students don't really want to come say hi to me all the time, but um, it did help because I, what I found was that actually if I had a typo in the question, they were like super ready to come tell me about that typo. And then we could lead into answering the question. Um, I didn't do it on purpose, obviously, but it did turn out like I started thinking maybe I should just purposely put typos in almost every question. Um, if there was no typo and they couldn't do it, they wouldn't really want to come ask, but somehow the typo sets them free. So I don't know, just a little something to think about. Christine, is is that something that, that you put in on purpose or... No, but the human element, making mistakes and having the students actually find those mistakes, it, it makes you approachable because you're human. You make those same mistakes they, they make. And I gave extra credit for mistakes that they found in my in my questions. So, um, yeah, I really think that the feedback that I got from the students at the end of the semester, I asked my students to write up a reflection letter on their experiences to write to future students. So they write those letters to a future student. And a lot of the feedback that I got from the textbook aspect was how much more enjoyable it was for them to be reading a textbook that they could do things in. The, the, the videos with the questions in it, they felt that it really helped them to understand the material better. The interactive activities kept it interesting as far as they were concerned. That's the kind of feedback that they were giving for the future students. And the assignment that I have them do, they know that I choose one per semester that actually goes to my future students. So, so they're seriously writing to those future students, not to me. And it was great to see how how much of a positive experience they had with that interactive aspect of the textbook. That's great, Laura. At DePage, um, is there did was there similar types of feedback um, that came to you from students? Absolutely, they um, by and large just loved it. <laughs> uh, of course, we did hear about tech issues, and that was of course part of the pilot um, situation. But um, they really enjoyed having kind of places to stop in the text that were pre-designated um, and give them an opportunity to engage in some metacognition. And um, not that they use that word necessarily, <laughs> but uh, yeah, exactly. They just they loved it. It, it felt like they were part of a living text, and they, you know, got to see their instructors change things on the fly to meet their needs, and that clearly had a very powerful effect on them. Do you, did you find um, that um, as, obviously we've got some very engaged instructors that are doing this. Is that something that was easy for instructors to make those changes on the fly? Yes, for sure. Um, and that's what we like about it is just how iterative the tool is. Unlike most things you might find in your learning management system, let's say. <laughs> well, that's, that's what we're striving for. So it's nice to hear that we've achieved some of it at least. Uh, what would you like your OER coordinators or your colleagues to know about your experience uh, with Pressbooks results? Uh, I'll start, uh, Christine, with you. That's a really good question. Um, I'm at the moment the OER director as well as being an instructor. So for me, it was... I was kind of the the testing the waters. I was the the one who got thrown into the river first so that everybody else can follow along. And um, I really enjoyed the experience and felt that it was super easy. I actually downloaded an outside program that allowed me to edit the H5Ps so I could do it when I was offline and not have to access my press books while I was doing it. And feeding it right into the press books, super easy, also very convenient. That that whole experience was a, a cakewalk for me. Then I started working with other individuals who want to try it out next. And 
my ease and comfort in my experience made it so that they felt completely comfortable. I did a walkthrough with them on doing an H5P and the next thing you know, they've created 10 H5Ps of their own and they're running, they're off and running with it. So it, as, as Julie had mentioned, it sounds a little tech scary, but if you are comfortable with it at all, it just becomes a walk in the park. It's, it doesn't take any challenge at all. Julie, how about you? Uh, I, I, you've mentioned that, the, how easy yeah. it was for you, but what would you like your colleagues to know? Well, I, I don't know. I, I say easy. It was, uh, it was easy. Yeah. Well, it wasn't easy, easy. It wasn't <laughs> like simple. I mean, it definitely was something that you had to focus. So, um, Unlike Christine, I'm I'm more of an OER advocate. So I'm that one faculty member. I'm an early adopter. I'm like, yeah, I'd love to do this. And so I'm like, here we go. And so, you know, but one of the things that I thought, one of the one of the things I wanted to share actually with this group and um is that um you have to find that time, right? So um, and as Laura had uh Laura had said, you know, you have to have a plan and not overcommit. And so I just saw in the chat, like it takes time, it does, right? And so when you're going to change your material, especially I've been teaching since, well, before the turn of the century. So I've been teaching for many, 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 many decades. And, and so you, when you change your stuff, you can really get committed and bogged down with the technology. And so I think that it's just keeping it super simple um, and, and knowing that is it, it is accessible, but you do have to, to have the time. So, and you have to make the time to do it well, not just to do it, just to do it. So, yeah. Nick, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you that, uh, and because time comes up and, and we can see uh, periodically, you've got a coworker with you. Um, so time is valuable for you. Uh, can you talk about that that time commitment and what you'd like your OER coordinator or your colleagues to to know about your experience? Yeah, um, the first thing I would say is that there is a there is a time commitment for sure. But um, you know, like Christine said, she has eighty. I have like a hundred of these in my textbook, and so it can be really intimidating when you talk to another faculty. So I would just try to emphasize like you don't have to do that. You can go over time, you know, like do one or two, see how it works, see if you like it, you know, and, 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 and pace yourself a little bit. Don't try to, you know, pick one chapter or something in your book to try to see if, if you can do this. Don't try to think like you have to fill your entire book with H5P activities by next term. Um, and the other thing is, uh, if you do want to do that, or however you want to do it, do, do look for some, some funding to help support your time. I was really lucky I got support uh, from Open Oregon to create the book and to do the H5P activities later on. Um, so, you know, keep your eyes open for that stuff and do look for it because you do deserve, you know, to be compensated for your, your extra time and in, in supporting students, so. That's great, thank you. Laura, I'm gonna turn that question over to you just about uh, um, what, what you'd like colleagues of yours or your OER uh, coordinators to know on campus. Yeah, I think Mick touched on this, but the whole, the whole thing of writing and remixing OER, particularly on the scale of a textbook, is so incredibly vulnerable. It's a very vulnerable state for faculty to be in. Um, and by starting with these activities that are quick to build and quick to get feedback and iterate upon, you're more likely to have success. So then you're more likely to keep using the activities and more importantly, confidence. Um, so for me, H5P is my secret sauce when working with faculty for instilling confidence in their broader OER work. Secret sauce, I like that. <laughs> can I can I also make one more comment that I think we haven't really talked about was the integration with your learning management system that you had mentioned in your slide very briefly um, that you know that's that was kind of the intent here. It's slick, you guys. Everybody, everybody can say that it actually is quite slick. And, and it really is an opportunity to really connect that textbook again with your learning management system. We do you, we use Canvas. I know there's other systems that are, are used all over the country, but that was probably the biggest sell for me is to find something that was just nearly seamless. There were some technical glitches, it was a pilot. 
but it was always troubleshoot, you know, we did some troubleshooting, we figured it out as a community, um, the Pressbook community, plus our OER coordinators, at my, um, at the University of Washington, they're pretty, they're pretty good, you know, and so they're quick to respond, and so there wasn't a lag, um, but that, that was another real motivation for me to join this group, um, is that slickness, yeah. That's great. Um, is there anything else I can ask uh, any of our panelists to share uh, that we haven't covered that you want to uh, talk before we uh, talk about before we head to some of the questions in the chat? Well, thank you each uh, for sharing your experience. Uh, I really appreciate that you've taken time to, to share it with others. Uh, that's uh, the great part about the OER community is it's all about sharing. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, Gabby, uh, have you been monitoring the chat? I have, and we do have one question that was answered in the chat, but I'd like to say it verbally just so we can go over it a little bit. Um, and the question was for Christine, and it said, did you say that the students had the same low level of engagement with OER as traditional textbooks? That statement resonated with me if I heard it correctly. Perhaps if there's ever a post-COVID era, students might engage better. So um, Christine, I know you answered in the chat. Would you mind sharing? So. I expected low engagement with the textbook because why would you want to engage with the textbook unless the faculty member is actively using the textbook and even then you get low engagement with the textbook with, with a lot of different classes and a lot of different textbooks. The key was actually using the H5Ps to get them more engaged. So to get them more involved with the materials and to get them more engaged with it. I use Cornell notes because there was a, an expectation that the students weren't going to want to read the textbook. And if they have to do Cornell notes and submit them to me, then they're going to have to read the textbook. You can't, can't do Cornell notes without having read the textbook. But what I found was the H5Ps, the feedback that I got from them was that that was what connected them to the material. It wasn't my Cornell notes just showed that they were reading the textbook and getting some of the main ideas, but the H5Ps were what they actually connected with and they enjoyed doing in the book. And I hope that answered the question. Yes, I think so. It's making that differentiation between reading the content and like engaging and understanding and retaining the content, which is definitely two different things. And glad that it's showing that it's working with H5P in your course. Um, and we also had another question uh, says, do any of you use Pressbook results sounds like it? So we're assuming yes, that each of you have used uh, Pressbook, Pressbook's results. Um, and while we're waiting on some other questions, pan, uh, participants, please feel free to put any question you have in the chat. Um, I have a few questions as well. And one that I have could be for anybody. And how can campus supporters of OER reach out to faculty to help them engage in this type of work? So maybe they don't know or they're interested, but how is it best to contact and reach faculty so that way we can ensure that faculty know about H5P and to get the work um, to be more involved in this type of work? I can um, share my experience. <laughs> I mean, the, the reason why I um, became engaged with OER is, um, you know, I've been working in digital with digital learning since 1999. So <laughs> that's a long time. Um, and it's, it's definitely changed over the many, many years um, uh, from just basically taking correspondence courses and putting them on a web page to, to now this really great interactive ability um, with this um, technology. But with OER specifically, um, as a faculty member, again, it's just hosting a workshop and, and, and there was a little bit of money, you know, that always helps. Um, but it's hosting a workshop and isolating faculty so that they're dedicated to you know, that time. So if it's just a week or if it's three days, you know, that's where that's where we're starting to get more hooks at the University of Washington and finding money to support um, faculty um, 
because it, it is, it's just basically your time, you know, you can do it for free, but, and it's not that we wouldn't, but there's a point in where it's, we need to be compensated for our time. So that's really what the hook was for me. Yeah. So I did little 15 to 20 minute workshops on my campus. Uh, coffee and content. And we, I just invited people to come in and chat with me and would walk people through the process of doing an H5P and inside their press books. If they had a press book, if they didn't, they could ask me any questions they wanted. And I just hosted those on a regular basis. And I intend to continue to do so in the next semester and have, have actually been asked. So I'm on a, I'm in a, single campus but in a 16 campus system so or whatever it is and so now I'm having people from outside my campus coming to my little workshops because it's basically a brown bag or a lunch and learn where you just sit down and have open questions and this is what I'll talk about but if you want to ask me something else that's been really helpful and it's gotten a lot of people interested and a lot of good positive faculty involvement and that's where i think we have more people coming in and doing more with h5p now which which i love <laughs> yeah if i could build off that i um, absolutely love the lunch and learns we did something similar kind of like oer agoras that were informal but faculty could still get um professional development uh, credits which was really important um but what made it especially successful is getting faculty who had already completed projects in the room and making sure we always had one or two people to talk faculty to faculty um, instead of me just, you know, showing how sexy H5P is. Uh, and that worked really well. Thank you so much. That was some really great ideas, just trying to help you know, continue that conversation and engage. And if y'all don't mind asking, were these in, were these virtual settings or in-person settings or both, or is it kind of switching now back to in-person? How are, how are we handling that? The answer is yes. <laughs> but originally <laughs> it was, you know, it was in-person prior to COVID, uh, the virtual uh, since, and now uh, I actually will be engaging in a workshop in a couple of weeks that will be hybrid. So I hope to be in, in the room, um, but yeah, it's all those things. Can I also add one of the things Gabby, as, as everybody was sharing too, is, is, is coming up with you know the value of the leadership on campus, uh, that value OER is gonna be what's gonna drive uh, success in implementing these, this technology. Um, and so when you've got you know Open Oregon, you've got um, you know eCampus Ontario. Those are those are things that are going to get they're going to hook faculty, right? And you're going to get a, a nice group. Um, and so I think that's really important too. So yeah, a little bit extra. <laughs> no, thank you so much for showing. I, that is a wonderful um, advice. And so now. I have another question. Again, if any of our participants have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, but I have a question now for the faculty side. So how long did y'all engage in OER work before you decided to start on the H5P journey? Um, and any kind of hints or tips or tricks along the way you know, from starting with that, learning about OER, then to adopting it, maybe creating H5P. How did how did that journey happen for y'all? So um, I always like to tell people not to follow my lead. As I said, I'm the one who jumps in feet first. Um, as soon as I started developing a press book, I had H5P in it. Uh, I did not hesitate. I threw myself into it. I started finding H5Ps that other people had developed. And if they were openly, openly licensed, they were going in my book if they fit what my materials were. I did backwards design on my course. So everything was matching my learning outcomes. And so those activities directly matched those as well. And then I found that I had areas which I couldn't find materials for. 
So as Laura was saying, I made a copy of the ones that had been done before and I just filled in the things that I wanted to ask. And it took me two solid weeks of work to go from absolutely nothing to having a complete OER textbook with H5P activities in it. But nobody should model themselves on me because that is a really bad way of doing things. Um, but that said, uh, I threw myself in and had a wonderful time doing it and teaching that following semester went so smooth. And one of the things I wanted to mention to hit on Laura's main ideas here, the students had access on the first day, every video had transcripts and there were links to text versions of the H5Ps and I made sure that accessibility was a part of my design plan as I was doing the backwards design. Starting from there, it was a beautiful experience for me, but a terrifying way to do it. So what I'm having my own faculty do is one step at a time, let's just do this one piece and we'll make that OER and we'll add those H5Ps and you don't have to go whole hog and nobody should model themselves on me. And we did have another question in the chat is how does the auto grading work is it they have to get a certain score before they can advance and this was touched on a little bit in the chat but if somebody doesn't mind sharing a little bit more on that side of it yeah so in terms of the auto grading and i'll let uh, some of our panelists also speak to this but it really um, depends on the question type and it depends on the settings and what your your goal for that question is. So uh, one of the most common settings uh, that the instructor can set uh, is whether you're going to capture the first try, the best try, or the average score over the number of times that a student uh, tries a question. And you can have uh, it set to whether uh, they can retry a question or not. So. I'll just share an experience that I had with that though, is don't change mid quarter. Make your, be committed and don't change mid quarter because students will be so angry with you. So, so really explore that before. And I think, you know, I was kind of doing stuff last minute and building as I was going. Um, and yeah, that was just, just a little bit of advice. <laughs> don't change. So when you say change, change between first try, best try and average score. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, I first thought I'll just give them the average and then then students were like, but in this class, you know, we usually take the best one because like they keep just basically guessing right. Um, and so I was like, oh, yeah, I guess that sounds fair. And then I changed and I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know, so it's just it's being committed throughout the, the quarter or whatever your semester um, and, and have a reason why. Yeah, yeah, that's that's important. Yeah, I use almost exclusively the um, best try. So about half of my questions are conceptual. And so they could kind of guess and, you know, for like a, a multiple choice or something like that. But about the other half are, they have to enter the correct value for something. And in that case, um, it really is, the best try is actually super helpful because they'll try and if they don't get it right and they know they have more tries, they'll come and ask. And that's where we can really learn. Um, and so that's been really valuable. And, it, and I, for consistency, I just make them all best try. So it is true they can just kind of guess on some of the multiple choice. But honestly, if they're in the textbook guessing that thing, I mean, that's, that's like, <laughs> that's a win right there. <laughs> They've actually opened it. So I'm okay with that. Well, I want to say thank you all so much for joining us today. This was an absolute wonderful session, and um, I really look forward to seeing y'all at other TCDL presentations and sessions. I'm sure if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to our presenters and panelists, and just thank y'all so much for all the wonderful advice you've given today on HIV activities. Thanks very much, Gabby. Of course. Thank y'all.